Today on That Ninja Show is a special episode here where I got the opportunity to interview the one and only Sam Furstenberg, director of Revenge of the Ninja, Ninja 3, uh, American Ninjas 1 and 2, plus he, over 24 movies that he's done in his career. Um, we're going to talk specifically about Ninja 3. It is going to be a two-part uh, episode or two-part series here. Uh, I'm going to give you the first part here to work with and enjoy. And then the second part will conclude with some questions from uh, some subscribers I reached out to. So here on That Ninja Show, Shadow Warrior Collectors, buckle up. It's time. That's my cat meowing in the background. That's good. Why do we have... Oh, wait, let me shut down this window. I'll shut down this window. Too much light. True to form director you are, sir. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> no, there is a lot of light today. A lot of light. Oh, now it looks good. Or oh, let's say it looks much better. So what were you working on with the welding? Uh, John, besides, you know, that nowadays that I don't... Ah, wait, 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 wait. All right. Nowadays that I don't, uh, I don't direct movies anymore. I have a hobby. My hobby is uh, uh, building furniture. Mm -hmm. So m mostly woodwork. But, but once in a while... I, I I try my um, my power my knowledge with with metalwork which is different completely different and I, I I needed a rail out outdoor we have a steps coming to the house and I needed the rail so I bought I bought all, all the the metal the, the metal stuff that I need <laughs> the pieces <laughs> and uh, that's it and I welded them together and the first the first section is done it's good. Awesome. So, where are you in? Where are you? You're... San Antonio, Texas. Oh, so but you have a German, uh, a German poster. Ah, uh, yes, you noticed. <laughs> I know, I know, I know this poster. I know this poster. I uh, I've been a collector of all the movie posters, so I, I've got a bunch of Revenge of the Ninja posters. Uh, most of, this one I've got from from Pakistan over here. I'll send I'll send you a picture of it, but. I've also got some from Lebanon and and from America as well, and so I, the movie posters were one of the, the one of the passions of mine when I was younger. So I was like, started getting more of them as I as I got older. So <laughs> ah, I see. Uh, I was in Texas last week. I know you know. I saw that. Yes, indeed. In, in Benton, Texas, which is actually Dallas. North of Dallas. Yes, you there did was the a Ditton Black Film Festival there. You beautiful festival, Black Film Festival, beautiful festival, uh, and uh, they screened this uh, River Band with uh, Steve James. It was beautiful screening, and uh, but I'm a veteran of Texas because the movie River Band was filmed in Texas, oh, in okay. Waxahachie. I know that area. Ah, so it was in this area of Waxahachie. That's where we, the, the the story takes place in Georgia in the south, but the money was uh, Texan money. The money came from Texas, so they wanted to spend it in Texas. But awesome. the Waxahachie, the area of Waxahachie, looks very much like the Deep South. Oh yes, yes indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where the movie was made in Venice, Texas. Most of it, not all. Of it. Anyway, so, very nice. So John, you want you are going. 
so basically you are doing interview for your uh, channel for your yes YouTube channel. Yes, I so saw I'm the gonna channel. Do an, it's good. I was going to do an intro on you that I wrote up the other night, and then yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll go into some of the questions and such. Any question you want, go ahead. Don't worry. You can embarrass me if you want. It's okay. <laughs> no problem. That is <laughs> not the plan, my friend. No, sir. So I'll start off with an intro. Good day, Shadow Warrior collectors, and welcome to the special episode of That Ninja Show. Shinobi One here with my very first guest and an awesome one at that. His directorial career spans over 24 films, which includes such favorites as Revenge of the Ninja, Ninja 3 The Domination, and American Ninjas 1 and 2. He's also a producer and a writer and someone who is well-respected in the ninja film community. And he is here today to share with us his time in working on Ninja 3 as we prepare for its upcoming 40th anniversary. Welcome to that ninja show, Sam Furstenberg. How are you, my friend? Excellent. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, hello to all the viewers. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, speaking of, you, you were at the Denton Black Film Festival. And, and so with the re-release of Riverbend, was that a, was that a massive undertaking? Because I, I thought I read somewhere where there was like no uh, video footage of it for a while, or there was like VHS copies only or something. So listen what happened. Uh, 19... 89, I directed a movie which is called Riverbend. And the movie deals with uh, racial injustice in the South. Uh, the film, the movie was produced by independent financing. It was not done through a film company, but just private money went into this movie. And uh, you know, when, when, it, when it was ready and uh, finished, the, the owners, the producers of the movie took it, took the distribution into their hand. Usually the directors, directors are not involved in distribution and they, they got some kind of distribution. And at some point, uh, a VHS cassette came through Paramount, which is a surprise. Paramount was a big company. So there is there is a VHS cassette that came to Paramount. I don't think it was a big um, uh, distribution deal. They didn't come up probably with many, many cassettes. Ba basically for the home video rental shops at the time, every corner, every street and every corner, there was a video rental shop. And it has some opening. It has some theatrical opening. In few, actually somebody not long ago sent me a... Uh, a newspaper clipping from an opening in New York. Uh, but it was short opening. It's a difficult subject. It's not easy, especially in the 1990s. And uh, and nothing was done with the movie anymore after that. So some of the VHS cassette have disappeared. And to begin with, the VHS cassette was not of the highest visual quality by itself, as it is. And the movie kind of disappeared. It was this, the subject. It was not. It's not a ninja movie. It didn't have this gimmick of the action movie. It had kind of it had a little bit action, but social drama, and it kind of disappeared through the years. And then there is a uh, entity which is called the Real Black, uh, headed by Michael Dennis, and he decided to restore to to find out what can we do with this movie can we bring it to a high definition can we bring it to a new level i for a while i pursued this idea to find out where are where is the negative where the elements are or who owns the movie but uh, i ran into dead ends no event michael this michael finally found a print a 35 millimeter print on ebay Somebody put it for sale, <laughs> a print of a uh, riverman. And this was our first uh, contact to, to a better quality because we nobody knows where the negatives, so-called the elements are, what we call the elements. And he bought the print. The print was in South Africa. So it was shipped from South Africa to the United States. Uh, they, they are in Philadelphia. Uh, Real Black is in Philadelphia. And then they send it, he sent it to scanning to scan it, transfer it from 35 millimeter into a video on a higher definition, on a high definition. Because trying to transfer the VHS looks so bad, <laughs> really, really bad. So, and then when when the file came, the video file came, it was full of scratches. Not, not because of the video, because the print was full of scratches. 
you know, pre, uh, screening uh, 35 millimeter prints again and again and again, eventually creates scratches, especially beginning and ending of the reels. So there were a lot of scratches. He found somebody who, who specialized in removing scratches. <laughs> so he sent the file to this guy and he removed the scratches and the dirt and the and the sound because the sound was optical the sound was the in the old way the sound was part of the 35 millimeter on the edge so the sound had some problem we fixed the sound and the print was faded so we needed to boost the color the vividness of the color and it was done today electronically everything can be done easy and uh, that's it so finally we had a high definition uh video file and uh, and uh, this film festival it, it was just recently finished all this work and this film festival the black the denton black film festival which is in its 10th uh, 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 edition uh, decided to let's say to call it premiere the the high definition of riverbend riverbend is starring by the way steve james which is in all the american ninja movies yes. in avenging force so it was a, an event and we found few people. Uh, I, I, the film was, fil the, the movie was filmed in Texas. So I found the producer, one of the producers, she came to the screening and the daughter of Steve James, Steve James passed away uh, a few years ago. So his daughter came to the screening and to, it was in his memory. The screening was. That's amazing. And was it a really good turnout? There was a lot of people yeah. that showed up? Yeah, fantastic. We did two screenings. One was for the, we gave one screening to the University of Northern Texas, of North Texas, to the film department. So uh, film students came and we had one screening with discussion, talking, you know, Q&A, the usual talking after the movie. And the second screening was in the festival, in a, in a theater, in a big theater, huge screen. The theater was full. So the word was out. People wanted to come. Uh, you know, fans of Steve James from came not only from Dallas, came from far away. Somebody came, one guy came from San Antonio. <laughs> and people drove long distances, uh, you know, fans of uh, Steve James. They came with posters for me to, to sign. To other so it was a good screening. And then there was a discussion, a, a panel discussion of the movie. And turnout was very interesting because uh, this movie deals with racial injustice in the south in the 1960s so it's 20 years earlier than we moved the, we made the movie or 10 25 and during the civil rights movement and the vietnam war but uh, in light of the changes that have happened in the relationship in the racial relationship in america lately the movie has a a new a new meaning than it had uh, when it was made 30 years ago so it was very, very good. I was surprised. And I was happy to see the movie High Definition on a big screen. It was fantastic. It looks better than 35 millimeter screen. <laughs> Are they planning on doing like a like a digital release or something? Or? So the plan is to do a Blu-ray, digital, okay. high definition, awesome. high definition discs uh, with additional material, commentary, um, um, gallery of pictures, the usual the, the <laughs> stuff that comes out with the uh, with Blu-ray and uh, Real Black, uh, uh, they will deal with it. They know what to do. Awesome. But we still we are still working on it. Uh, the print needs a little bit more work. He, uh, they are now working on the commentary line. A documentary will be added to it and additional material. But there are many fans of Steve James who are waiting for this movie and, and other people who like uh, movie preservation and, uh, and um, dealing with small independent movies that disappeared and uh, there are a lot uh, and this is it can be considered a black movie because majority of the cast i would say 90 percent of the cast because of the story is uh, are black actors so it can be considered it is considered a black movie so there are people who are interested in this subject as well they will be they will be happy to uh, i get a lot of requests a lot of questions when can we get a High definition. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Definitely. I think that'll be awesome. And then I know you mentioned some of the fans that turned up. I was going to go, but I, I had to work that weekend. They always call me in on the moments that I need to do stuff. Uh -huh. But um, 
But yes, I saw the photo that you posted of the Ninja 3 V8 Juice reference on the post. Right. <laughs> <laughs> was I saw some other Ninja Ninja movie fans in attendance that got posters signed from you, so that was awesome. But speaking of social media and specifically the Facebook boards, I do want to say that you are greatly appreciated by the Ninja movie fans, and we truly enjoy the moments you do share with us. I, I when I told a couple of my friends, I was like, I think I'm going to do get an interview with Sam Furstenberg. They're like, dude, no way. <laughs> so I kept telling my friends that I'd hope to get a chance to talk with you because we really appreciate you being engaged with the fans. So thank you for, for definitely taking this time with me today. To my my pleasure. My Ninja pleasure. 3. It's greatly appreciated. I do uh, uh, I, I do de devote a lot of time to this uh, the whole idea of preservation of the legacy of the action movies the independent low budget action movies of the 80s and the 90s you know 80s and the beginning of the 90s uh, it was a certain genre certain type of movies that today are considered a, a group of movies not only from Sam Furstenberg but uh, Joe Zito Sheldon Ledich other directors uh, Toby Hooper, etc. It's a group, so I, 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 I'm engaged and involved in the preservation of this group. And uh, but uh, John, the biggest surprise, really, I'm telling you, the biggest surprise <laughs> to me that this year was uh, last year was the 40th anniversary of the movie Revenge of the Ninja with Shokasugi. And the biggest surprise to me, uh, indeed, that. 40 years later, people are still celebrating and the, <laughs> the mass. <laughs> Absolutely, I am must, one, one must. And, and people are still watching the movies, those movies uh, that we created on a small budget, independent uh, type of movie making uh, 40 years ago, 35 years of uh, anniversary of American Ninja. And this year is the 40th anniversary of a different type of a movie, Breaking to Electric Boogaloo, that I directed. Yes. And uh, two weeks from now, there is a screening here. There is a theater that belongs to Quentin Tarantino, the Beverly Cinema. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, two weeks from today, they have a midnight anniversary screening of uh, Breaking to Electric Volcano, I will nice. be there and the actors will be there. So so this is the biggest surprise of my, my life, of my career, that so many years later, those movies are still exist. Oh, yeah. They resonate with audience. Young people see the American Ninja. America, I, there is a new generation of young people who, who are watching now the American Ninja. Uh, young kids, uh, uh, 14, 16, 20. So this is the biggest surprise of all. I've told a lot of my friends that are younger than me, it's like, I would never trade the 80s for anything in the world. You know, growing up in that time and being an impressionable young youth. I mean, when Revenge came out, I was, what, 12, 13 years old. And, and of course, before that, you had all the Star Wars movies and I was captivated by Star Wars. But yes, I mean, you are... You are monumental in in bringing you know sharing some of these movies with us and and so yes even forty years to to today we're all still very much you know had a profound effect on us on on how these movies affected us in such a big way. Some of us got into martial arts. Some of us got into discipline of of you know whatever lifestyle they wanted to take. And a lot of it comes from these movies. I found that in in putting this channel together, I was just like, hey, I'm one person. But I started getting feedback from subscribers saying, dude, I was I was the same way as a kid, you know, and I grew up and I went into karate and this and that. So it's it's amazing. Yes. To even see like today that people are still into these movies and loving them every every minute of it. So, you know, in the history of cinema, once every period, once every while comes it a type of a hero. You mentioned Star Wars. Star Wars was something kind of new. It was not totally new. It was based on other movies. When I was a kid, there was Tarzan. In the yes. 50s, I was a kid. Our hero was Tarzan. And Tarzan was a low budget uh, in kind of independent movies, not expensively made, but this was our hero. So here came the ninja was a revelation for this generation who at the, at the 80s, they were at the age of 10, 
to 22, 25. So <laughs> it, it came right in at the right time, at the right moment. And, and the, there was some kind of impression in these movies because it's nice, you mentioned Star Wars, but the, in the low budget independent movies of the 80s, we, in our budget, we cannot afford any optical effect, any digital effect. There were no digital effect, there were optical effect, but we didn't have budget for optical effect. So everything that you see on those movies, everything you see on the screen was really performed. So every stunt was really performed. Every car that flies in the air and lands in the water really performed. It's not the Fast and the Furious that cars are going I don't <laughs> know, against a digital background. It's not the same. So there is some feeling. It's subconscious. You know, you don't necessarily sit there and say, wow, yeah, this is... But subconsciously, as you watch the movie, you start to get the feeling that this is... Everything here is really done physically for real. It's not some kind of effect. It's not some kind of... No, we, we really... The, it was everything was really effects. performed. So, yeah. so as I call it, the audience can feel the pain. <laughs> If somebody gets punched, you can feel the pain. Or <laughs> somebody definitely. falls from three stories, you can feel the pain. Because it doesn't have this fancy effect. The feeling is a little bit different. So maybe that's part of the secret. Maybe. Yes, indeed. Or probably. <laughs> so in the 80s, Revenge of the Ninja hits the screen like a flying sidekick to the face. And then there is a desire from, from Golan and Globus to do another one. Uh, but with some distinct changes. So when they asked you to work on the sequel, and did you have any initial concerns about them not wanting to have Shokasugi in it? Uh, uh, okay, let's just recap a little history. First, Canon Film made the movie Enter the Ninja. Yes. With Franco Nero was the hero. So this whole idea of bringing a ninja, somebody from a Japanese mythology into the Western filmmaking, Western type of film, was a revolutionary at the time. There never be done anything like this. There were some ninjas in some Japanese movies, here and there in, in some Hong Kong movies, but not as a hero figure. And then the movie had some success. The villain was Shokasugi. Um, Shokasugi is real martial artist, uh, champion, etc. Uh, people who know martial art know who Shokasugi is. So, uh, so he was the villain. They liked him very much, the company. And they decided to do a sequel right away because it was making money. So they declare revenge of the ninja, but they decided to take Shokasugi, the villain, because they were impressed, so impressed by his abilities and make him the hero. So, Revenge of the Ninja, Shokasugi is the hero. He brought his son, Ken Kasugi, uh, to be in the movie. Then, uh, this Revenge of the Ninja was a, for a small company like Canon, was a big success because MGM picked it up for distribution. So, now we are talking about a movie, independent movie, which is distributed by a major film company, MGM. And it had a success. For for independent low budget movie, it, it had quite a success. So immediately they wanted to do a sequel. For some reason, I don't know exactly why <laughs> there was some friction between Shokasugi and the company, or I don't know what happened. And they decided to make another movie, number three, with Shokasugi, but he will not be the main hero, the main character. And uh I guess they had a deal with him, maybe two or three pictures. I don't know. So when I, by then I already made the Revenge of the Ninja, they called me into the office. The head of the company was Menachem Golan, you mentioned. And he told me, we are, we are going to do another Ninja movie, but we want a different, not Shokasugi. The hero. And for some reason, and he, it was his idea. He said, let's make it with a, with a female, with a, with a woman actress, with a heroine instead of a hero. Uh, you know, at the time, there was a little bit uh, kind of renaissance for women. Uh, of course, Sigonia Weaver, uh, of course, uh, Flesh Dance, that we'll get to it in a second, and, and etc. Some other movies that uh, ladies led to big successes in the box office. So maybe this was part of his thinking. I didn't ask. For me, as a young director, just making a, a, a another movie was 
great chance, you know, because I'm hired. It's not my uh, ideas, the, 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 the scripts, I'm not, I'm not the writer behind it. So I didn't really care if it's Shou Kasugi or somebody else. And, and Shou was meant to be in the movie anyway. I knew it. He was part of the movie. So our task, the writer uh, and myself, was to write a script for a, for a woman, but Shou Kasugi still needed to have a significant part in the story. Uh, and the writer was Jim Silk. He wrote also Revenge of Benin, Jim Silk. So that's that's how things turn out that we made th this strange or hybrid or different type of ninja movie. <laughs> awesome. I I saw an interview with show recently where he he did talk about Ninja 3 in that uh I saw it. Yes, he was he'd mentioned that he had quit Canon for a while too because I guess he was I guess he was kind of upset with the situation and such. Absolutely. But I, I was glad to see that that they, that he did come back, you know, and do do Ninja Three with you guys because I I thought that he really he really did tie in, you know, a, a you know my passion for. I was like, as soon as I got done watching Revenge of the Ninja, I was like, I want to see another Shokasugi movie, and I was like, it was awesome that he was going to be in Ninja Three. So as a fan, I was super excited to see that he did end up in the movie after all. John, there is no question about his martial art abilities. And I'm not a martial artist. I'm not from this world of martial art. But uh, no question about his martial art abilities. And and uh, even when, even as a director, when we did Revenge of the Ninja, he choreographed all the martial art fight in the in the group. He had a group of his student. He was the sensei, and his students came with him. He had a group. There was a core group that was with him all the time, and he with them he choreographed all the fights. Right. Usually the way it's done. Uh, the martial art fights. The other fights were choreographed by somebody else, by uh, Steve Lambert, the stunt coordinator. So uh, the way it's done usually, they choreograph the fight ahead of time because we are low budget, we are tight on schedule. We have to move all the time. We have to film. <laughs> we, we don't have the luxury of stopping. And so they will prefer prepare a fight. We find a location. They will prepare the fight. The day of the shooting, when I arrive in the morning, they show me the fight. So they they rehearse it for me as a director. And I might have a comment, I might not have comment, uh, I might have boosted up here and there or cut this little piece, whatever. But coming back to Shokasugi, when he was performing in rehearsals and in the actual shooting, I'm sitting on the chair because it's his show at those moments of uh, action sequences, I'm only with the camera. But just watching him, what a pleasure. Because he had the movement of a ballet dancer. His movement on martial arts are so precise, so beautiful. The fly kicks, the, the, the stands, the different weapon that he was handling. It was so obviously he's, he's and he's, he was a champion in Japan and he was, uh, you know, many, many um, trophies, etc. And so it was fantastic. When this idea came that we are going to make a movie that he is not the hero. Of course, he was upset because after Revenge of the Ninja and the success of Revenge of the Ninja, he saw a future for himself as becoming a star in martial art movies. Uh, another Chuck Norris, let's say. Okay, so he was upset, I'm sure, and and uh, and then he finds out that we, we intend to make a movie with a woman with a ninja. So he. Refused. He said, no, it will not work. It cannot work like this. Uh, a, woman, a woman doesn't have enough power of uh, a ninja. And actually, <laughs> there is some, uh, even in, I saw in some old Hong Kong movies, there were a bunch of ninja women. Oh, yeah. Usually, usually <laughs> villains, villainous. <laughs> but but uh, I, anyway, but this was his, uh, his comment. And he said, uh, uh, no, I don't want to participate in a movie that the, the main ninja, the main hero or heroine is. So now I'm stuck. Uh, uh, Jim Silk, the writer, and myself, we are stuck. How, how do we resolve the problem and bring Shokasugi to be part of the team, to, to, to participate and be one of us? So here we came at the time, Poltergeist, we were, I was very influenced by Poltergeist, it was a movie at the time. So... Here we came on the idea that she is possessed. 
like the exorcist. <laughs> she is not a ninja at all, okay? <laughs> she is the hero. There is a bad ninja. The bad ninja dies. His spirit, he possesses her to revenge. And there is a rivalry between the dead ninja and Shokasugi, the character of Shokasugi, from way back from the history, historical uh, rivalry. And but now he cannot revenge because the guy, the ninja is dead, but she possesses uh, his spirit. And 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 uh, and at the end, uh, you know, our idea was the end. The spirit leaves there, goes back to the real ninja, and Shokasugi will finish and resolve the problem and save the world. <laughs> <laughs> he liked that. Ninja idea. can stop a ninja. Right. So okay, he liked this idea. He gave us his blessing, go ahead with this idea, and that's how we continue. His relationship with Canon, not necessarily what I say, no, no, I'm hired by Canon. Uh, his relationship with Canon went sour from this point on. So he moved, he did other movies, you know, Nine Life of a Ninja, and, and the television series, The Master. Uh, so I stayed, I made more movies with Canon, but he left Canon. He didn't make any more movies with Canon. Now, in the in the ninja movies, he was not only the star and Shokazugi, he was supplying all the weapon. And he this was, I think it was part, part of the deal, his deal. And he was supplying some of the uniform, some of the uniform, <laughs> I, like the uniform you dress, you have it was done by a customer. It's not an, a real ninja. But he supplied belt and he supplied weapon, and so he was also making money from not only from the actor. There you go. It was part of the deal. Merchandising. Uh, but but anyway, he, uh, we were happy all in all at the end. And uh, he's the main, the, 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 main the, the, the saving hero at the end of the movie of Revenge of the Ninja, of uh, Ninja 3, the domination, in any case. But I, I, I heard the same interview that you did. I, and I, I knew, I knew the, his uh, discontent. I, I knew that he didn't like this whole deal. I... I had asked him a few questions about Revenge of the Ninja because because um, there were some some burning questions I wanted to know about and and of course you know like some of his favorite scenes that he did in in that movie but but you mentioned uh, Toby Hooper and Poltergeist and I I love that movie it was a great movie were there other movies during the eighties that during that time that had that you saw that had a profound effect on you where you were like that movie, I wish I would have either directed it or I can watch it over and over again, you know, from beginning to end. Well, listen, first of all, the, the, uh, <laughs> Ninja 3, The Domination is influenced by Poltergeist, Bar Exorcist, and by Flesh Dance, all together, and by Sigonia Weaver, you know, you take everything together, so it's a hybrid movie. We brought in the ninja element, I borrowed in from Poltergeist. I borrowed in from Exorcist. There is an exorcism scene in the in the movie. Uh, there is dancing like flesh dance. So I borrowed and you know together with the writer, but later on in directing for many movies, but not necessarily influence. I did not grow up uh, uh, as as a young film inspired filmmaker. I never saw a Hong Kong movie in my life. A martial art movie, so-called uh, what we used to call the kung fu movies, karate mm -hmm. movies. I never seen any. But when I was a student film, I saw a lot of samurai movies. I love samurai movies. The Japanese, Akira Kurosawa. So from uh, the relationship uh, between uh, hero and villain, it's the same. Uh, the Hong Kong movies I know today, are they are full of much more action that not necessarily have to do with the story always, action for the sake of just showing uh, this magnificent type of action that Hong Kong movies can produce. But what I was not, I never saw before Revenge of the Nina, Shoka Sugi introduced me to the Hong Kong style of uh, martial art movies. Ah, okay. Yeah, but samurai movies were, in, I was very much influenced by the Akira Kurosawa, but those are classics, Yojimbo, Seven Samurai, everybody, you know, many young directors uh, saw those movies, but they influenced me pretty much in action. But in, in general, I, I always like the, let's say James Bond. I always like the Hollywood, I always, always like the Hollywood mainstream action stuff. Steve McQueen, uh, uh, Westerns, I grew up when I was a kid, Westerns were our diet of movies, you know. We saw, every week we saw a Western. 
John Ford. You know, I I was a kid. I don't I didn't know what John Ford was, but or who John Ford was. But, but uh, you know, with the years, I discovered this kind of movies uh, that. Uh, the classic westerns were my our main diet of movies. Then we saw a lot of uh, adventure movies, as I told you, Tarzan, uh, Sinbad, Hercules, this this type of movies, and and um, those are the movies that I guess influenced me because th those are the movies I like. I never liked uh, European cinema. I don't like uh, <laughs> I like mainstream Hollywood action and drama. I grew up later in the years. I. I too grew up with westerns, and then uh, due to my father, and then uh, it just kind of transitioned on. Watched a lot of Star Trek on TV when I was a kid, a little black and white TV, and then my mom dropped me off to go see Star Wars when it first came out when I was like seven years old, and it was just like, you know, there was a lot of movies that started coming out in the in the mid to late seventies and early eighties that just kind of opened our imaginations as a kids, and and so. The movies that you brought to the table as well that kind of open our imagination and that's and i think that's why we still get drawn to them today because no one can ever improve on those things in my opinion it when i see remakes i'm like why fix something that isn't broken absolutely <laughs> but there, there are always new generation of filmmakers and new techniques of filmmaking and uh you know, uh, the action of movies of today, they are spectacular in view, spectacular. It's a different type of movie, uh, action movies, but they are spectacular. Uh, some effects that could not be achieved were way back then. <laughs> are there other directors that you watch that have an influence, that had an influence on you and how you directed? Or is there someone that you watched and said, that guy's style, I like his style, or... or or anybody that yeah, yeah no so i always in kind of i group those three i group i would group three directors but of course i saw many other movies but i would say alfred hitchcock john ford and akira kurosawa those are the two type of filmmaking director but there are of course other director who who would do movies like uh, alfred hitchcock you know oh yes uh, yeah. but uh, yes those those uh, those are the three uh, directors who kind of combine drama and action in a in a very nice, interesting way. Suspense, if you want, uh, drama, chases, action, action. Uh, David Lean, of course, with the you know the big movies. I love those big movies. Doctor Zhivago, uh, <laughs> Bridge Over the River Kwai, of course. Awesome. Yeah, David Lean as well. Absolutely. Later on, much later, but I was already there. You know, you know, when Steven Spielberg came up, I was already a film student. I was on my way. Ah. Uh, Joe's, I was still a student. When E.T. came, I was already a director, working director. So, of course, I love the, the movies <laughs> Steven Spielberg. But Spielberg. those are obvious. Those are the best of the best, you know. Yes, and I, I I I cannot name any esoteric uh, edge edgy directors. That's not my style. Mainstream. <laughs> I know for me it was Spielberg, Lucas, yourself, Kirshner, yeah. um, Ron Howard even put out some amazing movies too. I was oh, like, absolutely, oh, he's a great director. Like, from great, great, Happy great Days is doing some movies. All right, so it was yeah. it was amazing to see a lot of these movies that came about. But um, even though. Uh, the main subject of the day is, of course, Ninja 3. As you can tell, I am a huge Revenge of the Ninja fan. Right. I even have one of Shokasugi's stunt swords. I do, Revenge too. Revenge of the Ninja. <laughs> um, I, well, you know, the, the, the swords that you have in your background, I have two of them, big one and small one, that was given to me as a gift by Shokasugi. Oh, really? They are not sharpened. You know, I can take them out. So they were never sharp. Sharpen. I have a set of this that was given to me by Shokasugi. But years, years later, somebody sent me uh, this this aluminum, the one you're holding, which is a real from real from the set. I mean, the Shokasugi swords are not used; they're, they're heavy metal. We don't use them; they are very dangerous. Working, doing stunt. So we usually we use uh, the aluminum ones that you are holding. Which is a uh, which is a ninja sword, straight, not a samurai. Samurai sword has a bend, and right. 
So this is aluminum, and this was really used. I have one of those as well. But somebody sent it to me recently, not long ago. I never took one from. <laughs> <laughs> and and when we and sometimes we use uh, bamboo, so the same thing, but from wood, yeah. to be safe, you know, because you don't want to hit somebody with a sword. And sometimes from very difficult and dangerous, we'll use rubber sword. Okay. So of course they are painted silver; they look like sword, but for long long shot from far away, and we need contact. If we really need contact, you need the rubber sword. And then when we come to close up, then we'll use a real uh, steel, shiny steel sword for close ups because you cannot uh, cheat with those aluminum <laughs> for a close up. I ended up purchasing this one from my buddy Sean Scott. He he's a big big collector, and he went to he went to Shokasugi Studio like a while back, uh -huh. and he bought a bunch of these. And so when he decided he was going to sell one of these, I was like, oh yes. I've uh, always been a prop collector of some type, so I was like, I have to have it. <laughs> and John, the same goes, I see on your wall you have shurikens. Yes. And the same thing goes for shuriken. For tight close-up, we have a real metal shining, you know, stainless steel shuriken. But when we go back, <laughs> again, aluminum, and when somebody has to get hit with one, maybe it's from rubber, or from balsa wood, or from whatever, you know. <laughs> so there are tricks of uh, cinema uh, that... Uh, uh, you, you have to be sure about the safety of the actors. You oh, don't yeah. want to endanger the actor. So, uh, yes. So I also got one one or two of those shurikens. I did not collect enough stuff when I, memorabilia when I was directing. <laughs> but from Ninja 3, the domination, I still have, the one thing that I have is the uh, boombox, the big boombox radio that uh, Lucinda puts on the floor before she climbs up to the, uh, as she's dressed like a telephone technician. And she puts down the boom box, she starts the music, and then she climbs up. I have this box. I bought it. You still have the helmet, too? I was given, but I don't know. And I, I found out I still have her helmet, her uh, <laughs> uh, uh, telephone that company got, helmet. That so those are, got posted on the know, ninja board. So there yeah. is a picture. <laughs> yeah, you can tap on it. I'll give you a... Uh, John, I'll give you a link later to the, okay. all, the, all the photos, and you will be able to use whatever you want in the interview. But uh, so that's all I have left. And I have a sword just like the aluminum sword, just like you. Uh, <laughs> I did not collect memorabilia uh, during the, when I was working. We got to get you one of these next. <laughs> uh, yeah. Many people are asking me about this. I don't know. So did you feel that with Revenge of the Ninja, that it was, because there were some big movies that came out in the 80s that were sequels. Do you feel like for Revenge of the Ninja, it was part of that sophomore sequel success? Did, did y'all feel like that was an impactful movie at the time? or uh, You know, John, that the three movies, or the Ninja movies that Canon Company made, there are sequels, but they are not sequel in a term of plot or story or even character. They, they don't follow each other they, they, just by the title. So they don't, it's their sequel, but only by the title. So we didn't feel anything. When we approached Revenge of the Ninja, it was like, we have a chance, you know, not only me as a director, my stunt coordinator, uh, uh, Steve Lambert, Shoka Sugi, the cinematographer, the editor, the cinematographer was David Gerfinkel, the cinematographer, the editor was Michael Duthie. So we all felt, okay, we have a chance to make a movie. This movie, they're not going to survive. Those are, we are going to make a low budget movie. We'll, we'll put our heart into it. We'll do the best we can. And it was not tiny budget. We, we had enough time. This is an eight week, six day shooting, eight weeks. So, and two units. So it's, it's, it's nice. It's a nice uh, combination. Uh, nice outfit to make a decent action movies. So, but our feeling was that we are making a movie that will last, you know, in the theater maybe two weeks, and then it will go to uh, VHS cassette for rental another half a year, and those movies will disappear. The, like the truth is that most of movies disappear, you know, mm -hmm. out of the thousands of movies that are made every year, most of them you don't hear. Many, there, many movies I directed disappeared. We don't know. <laughs> Nobody talks about it. So this was our feeling when we were making the movie. 
and and then it was a surprise. As I told you, MGM picked it up for distribution. This was already a surprise. They they created this beautiful poster with the red sky and Shokasugi flying in the air. This was created by uh, right. This was created by MGM, not by Canon. Okay. And they had uh, and they they had com- radio campaign in English, in Spanish. I was surprised to the attention that they gave the movie, and they opened with four hundred print. Uh, uh, what they used to call east of the Mississippi, and then they moved the 400 print to west of the Mississippi. For a low-budget independent movie, this is a big opening. And it had a success. The Revenge of the Year had a success. So we were, all in all, we were surprised. I will tell you. The <laughs> truth is that we didn't know. But we gave everything we could. And the, and the one thing that I can say about Revenge of the Ninja, because you're asking me, which probably came from me, I did not want to make a martial art Hong Kong movie. Not at all. I had no interest. I wanted to make James Bond. So here there was an opportunity to take a little bit karate movie, a little bit James Bond, mash them together, mix it, and have the two type of action together. And luckily, Shokasugi was exactly the same. He was thinking the same, exactly the same thing like me. He did not want to make a Hong Kong type of a pure martial art movie. This was not in his mind. He wanted to make kind of Hollywood uh, mixed uh, movie. Martial art, action, chases, uh, guns, uh, you know, using guns, using uh, traditional uh, uh, Japanese weapon, martial art weapon. in Japan. So both of us, we working together. And uh, as I told you also, the stunt coordinator, Steve, so we're all focusing and going along this way. And, uh, and, Perhaps, maybe this is part of the uh, secret of the success of the movie, because it's a mixture, because it's a hybrid, because it's not, because I, I think that a Western audience, what we call a Western audience, and worldwide audience, you know, of course, there are fans of the Hong Kong type of movies, definitely, but they are not wide. And and this this formula that we created open the martial art movie to a wider open audience, which are not interested necessarily in martial art only. And and uh, new audiences. So this was uh, kind of the Chuck Norris audience together with the James Bond audience and <laughs> the martial art audience all mixed together. They all came to see this movie and they uh, they were impressed. So the movie kind of worked. So so the, the, the thing I can say about Revenge of the Ninja, it was a surprise to everybody including the heads of uh, Canon film. Everyone. Love that movie. And then um, I did get a hold of this off of eBay, and I go, and they did say that you signed this. At Correct. <laughs> I was in the... <laughs> you know, the, the I would say something about the music. Revenge of the Ninja, which is uh, has many elements. We, we mentioned, you know, even if you take the fight on the roof at the end, it's kind of a very urban, not yeah. Japanese uh, uh, element, but urban element. You go high on top of the roofs and you have a fight. And uh, and then came Rob Walsh with his music. And this music is a genius music for this movie. Really. I, I'm, I'm, I, I don't have to brag. It's not my music. I know I'm not the composer. It's him. He managed to to do the same thing, to take traditional action music with the Japanese elements and mash them together. So at some point, this heroic music with the Japanese, with the with the koto, with the, the, the Japanese uh, oh, mandolin, yeah. and, and with the chimes, and sometimes it's a sad music, but uh, particularly there is a scene that Shokasugi decides that he goes again to in his revenge and he goes to the temple and he breaks the seal of the sword and he collects all the and he stands up with the with the dress like a ninja the music soars to a fantastic Powerful. fantastic yes. <laughs> music at this point at this point of the movie so this this music is really beautiful beautiful music and it stays in character through the whole movie doesn't matter if it's martial arts sections if it's regular action sections he keeps this mixture of Western music, Japanese music, Oriental music mixed together, and it's beautiful. It's wonderful music. So 
you know, Rob Walsh passed away. He died. Yes. Uh, but before he convinced this company, Saraban, to come out with a disc, cleverly, because it's good music, and there was an opening. Uh, here in Los Angeles, you know, the launching of the of the of uh, the disc, the DVD, it was one of one of the comic store here, one of the famous comic book stores and comic character stores in Los Angeles. And uh, I was invited, but he did not come, Rob did not come. Uh, maybe he was sick by then already, but he sent me, there was waiting for me one disc with his signature. They had, I, I signed like 20 or 40 ones, like the one you have in possession. So it's real, I was there and I signed them. And then the store, sold them or who somebody sold it. Uh, maybe they bought all the copies from the company from Saraband and they sold they resold it. So yes, I was there. Exactly. This was the day. And you have still I think Stephen Lambert, Lambert and Steve, uh, and he was with really Steve. And Rob also? Yeah. Yeah. So he signed but he was not there. He did not come. So he sent a, a bunch of uh, signed uh, uh, sleeves like this DVDs. And Steve Lambert, the stunt coordinator, which is from Los Angeles, or was because he also passed away, he was with me in this. Uh, and we have photos. So later on, you can, if you want, I'll send you photos. Yes, indeed. Event as well. And I agree with you. Music, you know, for me, the, the key elements that make a great film, of course, the actors, the story, but also the director and the music. To me, it's like if all those are in a, a beautiful symphony, You've got you've got the elements of a great great movie, and that's what I what I felt about this as well. It was just everything just just fit really well together. Like like you said, it was it was a good it was a good combination of these elements here that just made a, a really awesome movie for a lot of us. And I think and, it's, again, and I was so lucky impactful I, to us today, John. I was lucky two times again. American Ninja, uh, Michael Lynn. Excellent music, heroic music, and uh, George Clinton, Avenging Force. Yes. All three, those yes. three movies have the best music from all the movies I directed. I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Now, of course, the way it works, uh, you know, there is some collaboration between the director, the editor, and the music, and the composer. So, you know, first composer comes in, we show him the movie as it is. Oh, we have some temp, temp music, that, the kind of direction that, that the editor and myself, we would like to go. So, and we discuss, then he will come with some ideas and uh, we'll listen, maybe piano only, what they we're going to do. Uh, and then we correct it or, you know, we, we go through it. But it is the work of the composer, no question about it. It's not our work. But it's a collaborative kind of guiding the, the composer to the way we see it. And luckily, uh, the editor of those movies, Michael Dutty, was very knowledgeable about music, had a lot. He, he used to be music editor way before that. So he had a lot of experience also in guiding, in helping and guiding the composers. And so we worked with them, but you know, they still, they, they write the music and they perform it later and they conduct it and they, you know. Amazing stuff. Can't go wrong with that. <laughs>